I'm Michael Bain and welcome to Triggered, coming to you from the secret hidden bunker in the Rocky Mountains at Dragon House Studios, where we're under lockdown because our governor, Jared Polis, now says we need a note to be able to go to our own bathroom. That way we can tell the COVID that lurks in the toilet not to jump out and scare us. Grr, grr. Anyway, I've been traveling a lot for fin finishing up this last season of Shooting Gallery. I've mentioned that numerous times on the internet. We'll keep talking about it. But after 21 seasons, Shooting Gallery will be wrapping this year. So last weekend, I was in Dallas. And I was there for the Pat Rogers Memorial Revolver Roundup. I think most people within the training community, within gun world, are at least familiar with, with the late Pat Rogers because he was one of the shining lights of training, just absolutely brilliant. And he shaped a lot of the trainers we work with today. Now, down in Texas, I was lucky enough to work with, gosh, Wayne Dobbs, Daryl Bolke, Greg Elifritz, Mark Fricky, Chuck Haggard. If you had to go pick five people that you wanted to work on a revolver with, those would be the five you chose. It was an incredible opportunity. Of course, you'll see it on Shooting Gallery. And I think end of February, something like that, maybe mid-February. But it's sort of a crash course in understanding revolvers, snubby revolvers especially. I shot this guy, one of Ruger's little brick bats. I also did some work with the Ruger GP100 3-inch, a little work with the new Taurus Defender, the six-shot 38 plus P. Now, why? I think this is a question I wanted to answer up front because it's the question we more commonly get asked. Why is it necessary to maintain the skills with the revolver and to transmit those skills to the next generation of shooters? Well, partly because it's useful. If you can shoot a revolver with its long double action trigger pull well, you can pretty much shoot anything well. And you know who told me that? Cherry Michelick, he probably has a pretty good idea of that. But once you get the revolver mastered, it's going to help your trigger pull across the board. Second thing, revolvers have some advantages that most people don't think about. For me, the first of those advantages is a revolver doesn't require you to be a part of the system. We've talked about here for years when you're shooting any semi-auto, then the semi-auto expects you to provide a certain amount of force against it so it has something to recoil against. That way the slide comes back, goes forward. Revolver, much like a honey badger, don't care. Revolver will fire whether you're attached to it or not, as long as somebody pulls the trigger. I could have a grip on this revolver like this, pull the trigger, and then the next time I pull the trigger, it would still go bang. Try that with any striker fired pistol, which are really sensitive to having that pushback on recoil. So the fact that a revolver doesn't require you to be a part of the system, I think is a major, major advantage. Second advantage is a semi-auto is designed around certain types of ammunition and certain velocities, pressures, all those things. We all know that. We kind of know that instinctively. Once again, like a honey badger, revolver don't care. If you can get it in the cylinder, it's likely to fire. Even if it's old, even if it's cruddy, fill in the blank, it's likely to fire. So if you see it from a prepper standpoint, you say, gosh, ammunition might get hard to find. Might be handy to have a gun like a SP-101 where you can shoot 357, 38 special, all kinds of weird, weird, um, weird ammunition in it that you, anything you're able to find 38 wise, you can shoot in it. So I always thought that was a, a big advantage. A third advantage is revolvers are nondescript. And I'm somebody who's traveled extensively with guns. And I sort of keep a running tally in my head what, what lights up TSA agents? What's going to happen that gets me called down? for them to look a deep dive into my gun box. And it's usually something unusual. Revolver isn't unusual. Revolver is boring. You know, if you're flying with guns, I never have them pull me aside and say, hey, come down here and explain this thing to us. They look at it and go like, yeah, it's a revolver. Yeah, let him go. 
which is not a small thing if you travel a lot with guns. Key thing that we learned from, from this particular roundup is sort of a best practices way of getting these guns to work well. Uh, I like Chuck Haggard's training where he's Steady. calling out the cadence and you Steady. are pulling the trigger. And it's kind of a step down drill. It's a very good one for a revolver. You start out with the, uh, one round in the cylinder, shoot. Then you open it up, don't look, spin it. When buzzer goes off, shoot until you hear bang. So now you fired two out of five shots, you're going to take this thing, you're going to spin it, you're going to put it back here, and continue all the way until all you get is clickety-click, click, clickety-click, click. You know that's, that's a skip drill, essentially, if you're familiar with a skip drill, and you should be if you own a revolver. It's a way to teach you not to flinch with a revolver by putting in some loaded rounds, some empties, and then spinning the cylinder, and you make sure when you squeeze the trigger, you don't snatch it. Straight pull through back. That was great. Greg Elifritz's work on retention, which I think is really super on retention with a revolver because it's slightly different than retention with a semi-auto. Semi-auto, we want to be up here. We've got this pectoral reference up here. The problem with the revolver is the cylinder to barrel gap. And so if you manage to get it way back there, flame is going to come out. It's going to set your shirt on fire. Now that makes for a great distraction especially a distraction for you as you're on fire. So one of the things Greg worked with us on was retention a little bit differently than you might see with the semi-auto. Got a gun a little bit farther out because you want to clear this grip. So there's an awful lot to it. Uh, revolvers are, are one of my favorite guns of all time. I've got lots of them. I shoot them a lot. And the revolver roundup was just incredible. So when triggered returns. Got a couple of great things for you. We're going to talk a little bit about snubby ammunition and then the return of Chef Mike, a rerun of the most heavily armed chef in America that you saw last year roughly this time. Stay with us. The revolutionary TCM from Rock Island Armory. Fire it once and you'll be hooked. The first thing you'll notice is its sonic boom and enormous muzzle flash as it hurls the exclusive Arms Corps 22 TCM round downrange at a blistering 2,000 feet per second with penetrating impact. It shoots surprisingly easy with light recoil. The 17 round TCM series, so fun to shoot, it's like a thrill ride, only better. Welcome back to Triggered. Let's talk a little bit about snubby ammunition. On the second day of the Pat Rogers Memorial Revolver Roundup, Chuck Haggard spent a lot of time launching snubby rounds through Jell-O, through your standard 18-inch clear Jell-O block. And some interesting things emerged, not what you would expect, not what you would expect. I'm holding this because these are the rounds that I typically carry in my own snubs. From Buffalo Boar, it is a 110-grain bullet, right? Well, here's what it looks like after 10 and a half inches of gelatin. You'll notice it opened. It didn't fully blossom like those beautiful pictures that you see in all of the ads, but it did open up a good bit here. And interestingly enough, it's the only one that opened up. A little shortage on penetration. Typically, we want to see 14 inches of gelatin penetration. This guy which is not plus P, it's low flash, low recoil, 110 grain Barnes bullet for snubs from Buffalo Boar, penetrated 10 and a half inches opening up. I think we all expected it to go all the way. And in fact, if that level of penetration worries you, you can get a Buffalo Boar plus P38, exactly the same 110 grain Barnes bullet, 250 feet pass, faster, it'll open up. However, Here's the thing, just in a nutshell, that you have to think about when you're dealing with the ammunition you put in your snubby. And that is, it is a balance between power and speed. Let's take accuracy as a given. But when you load your snub up with 357s, and Chuck loaded up some 357s, shot them through the gelatin, those rounds did great, really blossomed out. However, 
In a snubby, that second follow-up shot probably took a second or two longer. So there's your scales that you're going to balance. One of the more interesting things is 148 grain jacketed wide cutters. They penetrate great. Not only that, if you recall, those 148 grain wad cutters are designed to cut perfect round 38 special holes in a target. They perform exactly the same way if the target is large, human, and moving. They will drill holes and they will penetrate pretty deeply. The net net that we, we got out of shooting a lot of ammunition through gelatin is that when you spend big money on premium ammunition, the premium self-defense ammunition, it is not going to open up coming out of your snubby, coming out of a one and three quarter, two and a quarter, two and a half inch barrel. It's just not going to open up. It's not going to have sufficient velocity to open up. So what you're doing is it's, it becomes a wad cutter. It becomes a solid bullet. It becomes a full metal jacket bullet. And to a person, the instructors, said were they limited to carrying 148 grain target wad cutters, and I think every major ammunition company makes them, they would be perfectly happy with it. That wouldn't be first choice, but on the other hand, it would be a good choice. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people were using uh, Hornady Critical Duty, which is, was one of my favorite ammunitions. Uh, got good penetration, but once again, it, it, it mushroomed a little, but I think Chuck Haggard said, he goes, these are not the beautiful pictures that you see in the gun magazines with these like perfect bullets. That's not how they act out of snubs. We also shot some of, I'm trying to think of how to phrase it, uh, boutique ammunition, where it's like, wow, these are, these are, you know, death dealer. You pull a trigger on this and somewhere a Tyrannosaurus dies. And, and you know what they turned out to be? <laughs> Wide cutters. Uh, just like most of the bullets shot out of the snubs. So when you're choosing ammunition for your snubby, put it in your head that you're going to be drilling a hole. Or if you think you can control that 357, go ahead. It's nasty out of a short barrel. And Greg Elfritz's own research shows mo bullets is mo important than great big gigantic bullets, okay? Hits count. More hits you can deliver in a shorter span of time is a good thing. When triggered returns, it's lifestyle of the armed and famished. You're going to love it. This week's Triggered is brought to you by Franklin Armory, the home of innovation in firearms. Volkortsen, engineering the world's best rimfires. Taurus, USA, designed to protect and Revolution Targets, 21st Century Steel. I'm Chef Mike, the heaviest arm chef in all of chefdom, and I know that whenever you think about Thanksgiving, you've got that vision in your head of Thanksgiving, the first thing you think about is tarts. No, not those kind of tarts. For heaven's sakes, you think about a tart like a pie, right? So I thought maybe some kind of Thanksgiving tart. What about a sour cherry tart, maybe with cherries that grew on our own trees up here at the secret hidden bunker? Once again, they are the only cherry trees with uh, gun emplacements around them to keep the birds off of them. With your basic, wonderful English tart shell, kind of baked pastry shell, and filled with cream hot patisserie. And I probably misspell that. I flunked French in college, but I like my French teacher a lot. So, essentially, what is cream patisserie? <laughs> egg custard. Think egg custard. If you're Italian, think Sabignon. Any of those are more or less the same product. And the way you get there is pretty straightforward in any culture, is you're going to mix eggs, sugar, about two and a half pounds of cornstarch. You're going to add that to hot milk. You're going to boil the milk, pour a little bit of the milk into the egg mixture that you put together. Because if you just dump the egg mixture in, you know what you get? Scrambled eggs. Ask me how I know. Uh, cream patisserie is, is not an easy thing to do, and that's because it is stupefyingly boring. The key to the whole thing is that you keep it over very low heat and you stir, and you stir, and you stir, and you stir, and you stir. 
stir, you stir, you stir, and you keep stirring until it thickens to the point that you want. Now, interestingly enough, there's another side to that. I had to do the cream viscere twice. Let me confess that. I mean, it's not the first time I've made egg custard. It's not even the thousandth time I've made egg custard. However, sometimes you just screw up, and so I made it too thin. And then I thought, I can fix this. Here's a hint. You can't start over. <laughs> what you end up with is, in fact, the equivalent of a soccer ball made out of egg yolks and milk. You can bounce it, you can kick it, you can do all those things. So, start over. I need a crust. And it's basically, your, you know, kind of your basic English pastry crust. It's not hard to make. We have, in America have made making crust into some sort of bizarre religion. I can actually tell you that. Uh, my grandmother had me study with her to make crust. Like, this is how you do it. And the reason she had me study with her is because she taught my mom, and my mom couldn't make, cr make crust worth crap. So my grandmother thought, maybe I'll start over. Just like with the cream patisserie, if it doesn't work once, start again, crack some more eggs. She taught me how to make crust. It's not that hard. What you're doing, basically, is uh, you're bringing flour together with butter and sugar. And then wowie out, you're rolling it out. Put it on a flour thing, you're going to roll it out, you're going to get it to a certain thickness, in this particular case, about that much, uh, uh, three millimeters, which I have no idea what it means. Although I have a scale that only reads in, in English measurement in grams, because I use mostly Paul Hollywood cookbooks, because let's be honest, Paul Hollywood is God. Paul Hollywood, imagine this, I mean, I just want you to try to get your head around this. Rock stars, you know, famous people, famous athletes. Paul Hollywood tours England baking in big venues. People pay money to see Paul Hollywood go on stage and bake. Think about that. Wow. So, anyway, he's also a race car driver. He's also the most sarcastic man in the entire planet. So, as such, he is my hero. So, carefully make the dough. Roll it out. I had to roll it out twice. Don't be afraid to do that because you, you get this ball of dough, you kind of got pack it down, sits in the refrigerator now, anywhere from like three hours to a year and a half. You pack it back out, you're putting it on what you're gonna roll it on. You roll it out and it's not quite right. You might want to toss a couple of drops of water on it. Boom, being a couple of drops of water, it's a little bit wetter. Make another ball, reflower what you're doing and roll it until you get it just right. In an ideal world, you're gonna lift it up, drop it on, stuff it in, and it's not an ideal world. So hopefully you're gonna get the bottom in and you're gonna work around the edges till everything is sealed up tight. And then this is what you call a blind bake. That doesn't mean that you have to do it with your eyes closed, although, what the heck, works fine. It means that you're gonna fill the crust up with beans, in my case, Great Northern beans. Or if you've got baking beans, which you get at an expensive store, go onto Amazon, check out how much they cost, go buy a dollar sack of Great Northern beans, because what the heck. Fill it up and you're gonna initially bake it with the beans in it. You're gonna make it a little bit browner that way going to come out, you're going to let it set, you're going to dump the beans out, you're going to get every bean out because there's nothing that sucks more than a big bite of tart with a great northern bean in it. I mean, or worse yet, aluminum. So, you got this and then everything is going to cool, you're going to fill it with the, the cream patisserie, you're going to top that with cherries, which you're going to cover with a glaze that you have made or I have made from framboise, which is essentially raspberry favorite liqueur and raspberry flavored jam to go over these wonderful, wonderful cherries. And then you're going to sit down like a complete hog and eat it because you want it completely eaten before the Thanksgiving guests show up. Hey, I'm Chef Mike. Stay armed.